Welcome to Obey Your Strengths with Gallup Certified Strengths Coach and self-proclaimed strengths geek, Kathy Kirsten. Hi, Strengths fans, and welcome to Obey Your Strengths with Kathy Kirsten. My guest today is Jeff Deverter. Hello, Jeff. Hey, Kathy. I'm so excited to be here. We've been talking about this for a while. A while. This is a long time coming, and it's so nice to have you on my podcast now. I've gotten to be a guest on your podcast a couple of times, and so you're returning the favor. So thanks so much, Jeff. I can't wait to dig into your top five strengths and learn more about how you use them, even though I know a little bit because we have some history together. Jeff, Me too. tell my audience who you are, what you do. Sure. So my name is Jeff Deverter, and Kathy and I know each other from our time at Rackspace. Kathy is, of course, doing all things strengths these days. I joined Rackspace in 2008 and was there for about a decade, so left in 2018. Uh, bounced out to another cloud company for about a year and 10 months, and then rejoined in January of of 2020, and uh, and have been there ever since. So uh, I do all sorts of things over there. I've led teams. I was originally brought into Rackspace to build up a product we called uh, dedicated or single tenant SharePoint, and had all kinds of Microsofty things, and built lots of teams at Rackspace, and then. Uh, and now I, I, I do other things in and around the office of the CTO, helping to tell that, that Rackspace story and to uh, work on our uh, strategic roadmap. So that's what I do over at Rackspace. That's amazing. And, and I know you so well from your SharePoint days. And then I've gotten to watch what you've built in the office of the CTO uh, around evangelizing tech and cloud and really just being and you also talk about leadership so you're passionate about a lot of things and i think that comes through in your top five strengths or because of your top five strengths so jeff let's just jump in right there and tell us what are your top five strengths and, and a little bit about each one. Oh, look he's hoping for those who aren't watching us on on our youtube or any feeds he has his strengths on his security badge that's awesome jeff that's right tell right us. there <laughs> and and I'd like to say that it's because I'm clever and smart and and chose to do that so I wouldn't forget because I have to build lots of coping things because I do like to forget things. But it's actually just on our badge. It's what Rackspace does. They take strengths to this crazy level. Uh, and so it's always right there. In fact, it's great to get to be, that being there. You get to see what other people have and, and, and engaging in meetings. And well, when we used to have face to face meetings and have to have yep. a badge to get in a building. Right. But uh, but my strengths. Uh, let's see. Top five. Strategic, ideation, relator. I always want to say realtor, but I don't buy and sell real estate. <laughs> uh, individualization and achiever. Oh, well, no wonder you have a hard time remembering. Your, your, your head is full of ideas, Jeff. Ideation. Okay. So how would you describe, let's just stop, start with number one, strategic. In your own words, how do you think strategic shows up in you? Yeah, so, you know, I used to always say when people say, what would you enjoy about about when you work? And it didn't matter really what the job was. And I would always say, well, I like bringing just the right people together for just the right project to create an incredible outcome. And as I've thought about that, especially since we've been talking over the past few weeks about about getting together today, is I think that's really where strategic falls together is is I can very clearly in a lot of cases envision what that that end solution should look like. And it's clear as day to me and, and sometimes comes to me just just that fast. Now, how do you execute against all of that? If, for me, it's super easy and it would frustrate me, especially in the earlier days of my career, because I would say I would get up and I would explain it to the team and go, see, isn't it just perfect? Isn't it just it's where we need to be? And then, of course, you know, I've got different, um, you know, strengths in the room and some are going, I don't know how we're going to do that. And, and they say, well, where's the plan? Well, plan? We don't need a plan. Look over there. That's where we want to be. And, and for me, that was strategic. And so very ad hoc in the earlier days, especially is just just, again, bringing the right people together who I knew in the chemistry and their skills and and ultimately then would learn the words strengths and all of them associated and what that would look like. So I think for me, strategic is knowing what the end looks like and, and being able to figure out the shortest path from where we are to where we want to be. And then you also, in that description, looped in some individualization, knowing the right people for the job. So you sort of killed two birds with one stone there, Jeff. Good job. That was strategic. <laughs> it was very strategic and quite accidental. <laughs> well, let's talk about 
you being at that 10,000 foot level, strategic has to also play in very well with ideation. How do yeah. you see ideation showing up for you? Well, you know, st strategic kind of is that mode of that's what it looks like over on the other side of the river and that's where we want to be and this is why it's a good reason to be there. And then ideation is all the ideas of how to how to make that actually occur, what those right people might be, what the tools might be needed, what resources might be needed along the way to make that happen. And uh, I guess this is part of strength because what I wanted to say is when we, you asked me about strategic, I say strategic's my favorite. Then you asked me about ideation. Now I want to say ideation's my favorite. <laughs> Um, because you sit around and think about what's the right idea, what's the right method, the people, the resources and things to pull together to make that a reality. And, um, and, and for me, a lot of times I'll just, it's just sitting and thinking and visualizing. I'm a very visual person in my brain. And, uh, and so that ideation tends to be very pictorial in my brain and, and, and what that's going to look like. Oh, I love hearing that it's visual for you. Do you whiteboard a lot? Like what kind of systems and tools do you use to feed your ideation? Yeah, so um, whiteboard is a, is a really good way because when, I, I always joke about saying I have a healthy little dose of ADD, but I, maybe I don't. Maybe what it is is I have ideation on steroids because what, what, what the benefit in my brain, of course, it's visual, but the benefit too, I'm glad you said whiteboard, is it starts to create anchor points. And those anchor points then are are here's here's an idea. Now I can I can I can flush that idea out, and then I can start to think how do I get to that, or where do I go from that? And that's where really that whiteboard and drawing the line to the connective tissue of the rest of it start to pull together. Because without that, again, the ideation on steroids uh, just just you know you end up with this flurry of ideas, this cloud of ideas that that don't necessarily all the time pull together, and it can be fun to go through that process, but it, it also can at the end be exhausting uh, because it does take some mental acuity and, and some calories, I think, to burn and, and pull that together. And again, the benefit of having either the, the physical whiteboard or, you know, the virtual whiteboard of having a tablet at hand at all times uh, is really a big help for that. Yes. Jeff, way back in the day, before tablets, I was sitting with a software engineer who had ideation and I asked him, how do you collect your ideas? And he pulled out, out of his, okay, I was at Rackspace, so let's be honest, it was cargo shorts. <laughs> I'm sure they had no out. shoes on, but yeah, at least he had, had cargo shorts on. Yeah, flip-flops and cargo shorts and a t-shirt. He pulled out a deck of index cards that were bound together with a large binder clip. And on that, every card had an idea, a script, a, a uh, something to do with, you know, you know, one of the languages that they code in. I don't know much yeah. about software development, but he had collected his ideas in that stack. And I thought, gosh, that stack has to be worth, you know, quite a good amount of money uh, to think about just how many ideas he has there that could generate new things, new products, new uh, developments, new apps and all those things. So anyway, I think it's really cool to hear about how ideation people collect their ideas. Okay, let's let's round it out with your uh, relator and achiever. Relator, you shared a little bit about knowing people's strengths, but what would you say about relator? I think relator, you know, I feel like there's a I have this strong pull to want to make sure that that the person that I'm talking to, I'm speaking in a way that is a way that they can receive it, and at Rackspace. Again, going back to when we were always in an office, you know, we had, I should have brought mine, uh, a little you know, table tent card. And you got those when you would, uh, when you joined Rackspace and you go through what we call Rookie O, the, the week long um, orientation. And, uh, and, and, and everybody would leave them on their desks, which was great because you would know everybody's name who sat at the desk. And, uh, but it had those strengths listed on there. And so as I would walk up to have a conversation with somebody, I would always look first at those, at those, um, at their strengths so that I would be speaking in a way that they would be best to receive it. And 
we were joking the other day. I always say, and I stole this from from previous racker and good friend Shane Young. He would always say, if I walk up on somebody who's got a bunch of hippie strengths, a lot of emotional type things, you know, you're not going to walk in guns a blazing with a task list. You're going to walk in. How was your weekend? Tell me about you know, what you have for breakfast. What's your favorite coffee? What's your favorite color? Um, you know, you relate to them. You you kind of build a a, a might little bond with them. If you've you've got a history with them, you're asking about previous stuff. And then you dig in. If I walk up on an achiever, I'm walking up with my my project list and we're just going straight into it and say, I have a problem with line 173 and I need some help. What do we have to do about that? Ah, oh, that's so great. Meeting everyone where they're at, the key to understanding their strengths, right, can give you a tool in that toolkit or so that you meet them where they're at and open their ears. I once heard this person say, uh, speak in the shape of the other person's ear. And at first I thought that was the dorkiest thing I've ever heard. And then I thought about it for a minute. I'm like, no, wait, that's a strengths quote. If we pay attention to what the other person needs, you know, I could think we could riff on that all day long, Jeff, about how we might approach a person with analytical, lead with the data, a person with context, lead with the historical information, a person with futuristic, lead with where we're going. And what does it look like when we get there? Oh my goodness. Yes. We just... Keep going all day long. Okay. Come I know. On, I but if only the whole world would walk around with their badge on and you could <laughs> see what, what, what they were, we should have tattooed somewhere. That's why I have I try to have everyone I know take the strengths finder, Jeff, to be honest. It, it's, <laughs> so a thing. it's a good thing. It's a good thing. All right. And then you know, I think for a person who has big ideas and strategic and ideation, I bet achiever is a saving grace. So that you can get out of dreamland and move forward. Tell me, how do you use your achiever? Well, you know, it, all of the other ones are, of course, they're all great. But but at the end of the day, they don't have anything that tangibly has a has a has an outcome, has a has a finished thing. And so, for achiever, um, thank God I've got that one because that's that itch that I have to scratch. That at the end of the day, you know, those the 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 projects have to move forward a certain number of clicks. And without that, then, you know, there, there's a sense of incompletion. And so it's not just all about, hey, let's make up a great idea for the future. Well, let's also move the puck down the down the, the rink a little bit and in the direction of those to make sure that we're start we're accomplishing something tangible in the process. Does it help you stay motivated when you get things done? I mean, I can imagine this context switch between dreaming and ideating and then getting things done. Do you have that whisper of discontent if you don't have a productive day? Do you, does your achiever kind of kick in and want to get a few things done on the list? It really used to bug me a lot, actually, because as, you know, working as a, as a, um, inside of IT or anybody who works in a, in a, what's the phrase I'm looking for? Um, uh, anybody who works in, you know, this mode of an, uh, of an information worker, that's the phrase I'm looking for. It's not like I'm a furniture maker. And at the end of the day, if I don't make five new chairs that I haven't been successful. So with, when you've got achiever and you're just going through an ideation process, cause you go through, there are seasons of just, let's think through how to do this in the future. Let's plan for the next quarter. Let's think about the next year. Um, is if we don't get to a point where we're thinking about the plans or the steps to get to that, then that does does inside of me start to create some discontent. And earlier in the career, I would absolutely I had trouble turning off at the end of the day because if I didn't get to a point where things were starting to I was checking a few boxes, then I was feeling like, well, have I created value for my my organization today? Am I earning my paycheck? And uh, what I you know, as a maturity process now as I'm a little farther in my career that, uh, that, that I realize that there are seasons, there are ebbs and flows to that. And so, um, I'll make a mental note at the end of the day, if it's been a very strategic or ideation sort of a day, um, and, and I'm not feeling quite settled to just like, all right, well, just relax for a minute. Let's see what it's like at the end of the day tomorrow. And if I'm ending the week or the next week and I'm not moving things forward, well, then I've got to work on my priorities a little bit as well. I thank you. Can I just put like, dive in here as a strengths coach, just to talk a little bit about what you just said and how you in your earlier career and then refined it and matured that achiever. Man, aren't we all on that same refinement journey the entire time with our strengths? So we see ourselves in our younger days, our strengths show up more raw and we yeah. have a harder time catching ourselves using them or regulating it like your achiever where you feel discontented but as you move through with work experience and just practice and perhaps great mentors and just 
really a self-awareness growth, a growth in self-awareness, realizing and refining your talents and your strengths to realizing it, I may be stuck in meetings all day today, but by the end of tomorrow or a milestone, like the end of the week, if I feel like I'm not making impact, I can get down and head, but I don't get frustrated on the daily because of my, my achiever. And I think that's really a, a journey that achievers have to take. We're all taking that journey for all of our strengths, Jeff. So it's really, I'm glad you said that. That's part of the strengths development process. And that was a great example. But I think it's people. it's a big part of just, you know, it, your day goes a little easier if you've got grace for people that you're working with and a little bit of grace for yourself if things don't fire quite right or not as expected. And that includes how we're, we're manif how those strengths are manifesting in our day and which ones get their exercise and which ones don't. So good. That's a great sound clip there, Jeff. Let's talk about teams because we get nothing done by ourselves. That's and right. I know that you and I have a shared belief around the importance of teams and how to use strengths to, to accelerate collaboration and to move faster with speed and, and to create more, uh, I guess, maybe harmony, or I mean, that's not even the right word, but cohesion is probably the right yeah. word on our teams using strengths. So talk to me a little bit about what you've experienced with teams and using strengths. Sure. So, you know, in the, in the early days when you don't have a strengths lens to look through a team construction, then you really only have the lens of capability. So does this, does the, does the, do the people that you're bringing into the mix have the technical aptitude, the mental aptitude to do the job for those watching at home, air quotes, do the job. But one of the things that we've learned uh, over time, and you hear a lot of it these days, is that word, I'll just pull out the word diversity. And, and what I want to talk about for a second is that, that, let's just think about art for a moment. Uh, there are a lot of really interesting paintings or pictures in the world that use a very minimalistic approach to color. Maybe they're going to do an experiment in charcoal. Maybe they're going to do an experiment with, with duotones or just a couple of colors. And those I think are personally are interesting to look at. But if the world was just in a monochrome or duotone or very limited palette, you can still do the job done. I can still have a painting of a cat or a house or a mountain, but it's going to lack, in my opinion, the depth and the quality that could be there. So when we think about team building, and we think about capability, that's that ability to draw the picture of the house, mountain, or, or cat. But then we look at it through the lens of the different strengths that are there, is those different strengths bring actually, one, a capability to do the job. If we've got a whole bunch of ideators and strategic people on the team and no activators and no analytical, um, we're going to have a whole more ideas than we have output which is not necessarily a good thing. But if you can bring those different capabilities together and think about that and make purposeful decisions about it, and maybe you're not hiring because you're thinking, hey, I've got to go find me a, you know, an analytical person. But, but, but more to the point of when you're looking at the people to bring into a team to really consider those strengths and what that new color is going to bring to the palette of what the team is going to do. One, from the team cohesion, how's everybody getting along? And then two, what does the quality of that output look like? I can imagine on your on teams that you've worked on, you've really appreciated the people who bring the detail orientation side. Is that right? Is yeah. my guess correct? Your guess is very correct. Always bring organizers <laughs> around to capture the ideas. And my wife always says, she says, and she she she's not she doesn't she has not taken the strength finders. Okay. But she always says, Jeff, you're the idea guy. You just need somebody to walk behind you and pick them up and figure a way to execute them. That's right. <laughs> You need someone in the details, figuring it out, mm -hmm. how to do it, catch the idea and make it come to fruition. That's what you need. That's right. <laughs> oh, I love it. Well, you know, I'm sure that uh, most of my listeners have heard me talk about team strengths workshops, but one practice that they, that I did at Rackspace and that Jeff, you've been through probably a number of times is where a coach would come in and work with a team, helping teams just prompted, prompting teams to have a great conversation around how they're using each of their top fives. And then what are the implications of having those strengths and sometimes weaknesses uh, as you move forward into uh, the next portion of their work or their strategy, right? So it's really great to do it a, a half or a quarter where you get to come together and, and relate to one another through the language of strengths, but then also figure out how to uh, 
make two plus two equal five. You know, yeah. in technology, so many times we're under accelerated growth or under pressure to deliver something big and new and make impact. And that takes more than two plus two equal four, right? You know, you need to, you need some of that alchemy, that magic of strengths yeah. coming together. But a lot of times it, it it's what those workshops would do. And I would see them used in a couple of different scenarios. But the, the first part is it just is it takes you and it gets your eyes off of the page. Like I'm looking down if that's where the work was getting done and just look up at the horizon for a second and everything that's happening around you so that you're taking that into account because it is absolutely an you can think of it as an out, outside impacting force. Just like, again, we are, if we're hiking from here to there, we're going to look at what the weather is doing because it's going to impact us. I think if we don't look at the strengths that are on our teams, then we're either going to find that there are competing um, agendas is the wrong word, but there's stuff that's going to impede our process um, just be by the nature of uh, potentially of, of the, the strengths that are there or not there. And there's also resources that we may not be calling on to help us get from here to there. And so, and so what I love about the, when we would do those, those team workshops is it's that point in time to go, hey, look up, pay attention, look what's going on around here. Now, these are the resources that are here. Let's, let's enjoy them. Let's celebrate them. Let's look for where we have you know, some good, some good um, collection of capabilities. Look where we maybe don't have those. Now, the other time I've seen it used is when you have dysfunctional teams or teams that are not getting along, teams that aren't delivering, teams that are, that are, that are fighting, and uh, it, it happens everywhere. But it's a very mature thing then to stop and do, this, do the exercise and look up and go, what are, these out, what are these potentially outside impacting forces that are causing this dysfunction on the team? And let's and you know recognizing that as an issue, then you can deal with the issue. But if you don't recognize that and what may be causing it, you don't stand a, a chance at, at solving it. Right. It's a very positive way to move through team conflict when you can point to a strength or, or to an over point to an overuse of a strength, perhaps a strength that's become a weakness. Yeah. Right. And, and say. Ah, that's what's going on. It comes from a positive place of being productive, but in this scenario, it's not productive and we have to move through it. And having the language, a positive language, a uh, positive intent, like we believe that your intent is positive, but we still have the, this mountain to climb together. We can do it together through the, the language of strengths. It, it makes me think about one of the teams that I've been recently working with who has some struggle and the reason they're having struggle and some of their strengths are showing up loud and maybe in the weakness zone is because of the amount of pressure that's on the team at the moment right so they've they've endured uh cutbacks of budget and resources and so they're it's more important than ever for them to be firing on all cylinders because they're yeah. running with less and yeah. so you know and that's a tough thing to do. You got to focus more on your energy and you got to be more self-regulating uh, because you're under stress. And when we're under stress, we're less, we're less aware of how we're showing up. So yep. it's good. Yeah. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. Cause you could just walk into a room and you get a, you, you get your strength counselor. That's what I call him a counselor Yeah, in the room to say, Jeff, why are you and Doug not getting along? Why do you keep yelling at each other? I mean, you could take that approach and that is just, will you two kindergartners please get along? Or the, the fact of let's get to the, the deeper thing. And in this scenario, fictitious as it may be, um, you know, it's maybe you got two, you got two folks with strategic in the room and no analytical. And so I'm saying we should be going over there. And Doug's saying, no, we should be going over there. Prove it. I don't have to prove it. I just know it. Well, that's a problem. Yes. Uh, it's such a good point because strengths help you understand how people are making decisions, the pace of which they're comfortable in making decisions, how much detail they need to make decisions. So, yeah, it puts it all out there. Okay, uh, Jeff, have you used strengths at all? You said your wife hasn't taken it, but have you used strengths at all in your personal life? I know you're a father. Uh, tell me a little bit about how you've used it outside of work. Yeah, so I will... Um you know, think about strength. So my sons have, have taken it, especially my older son. And, and it's just really helpful. Again, I would say just in the exact same way I would use it at work to understand the individual is going to, it's going to very much modify how I'm going to approach, uh, in, in this case, my son. So even with my younger son, very analytical, uh, very thoughtful. And so I'm not going to come in guns a blazing with a vision. I'm going to come in and 
and, and really help to lay out the case in that scenario for why we're you know, doing whatever it is what we're doing and uh, or what's happening. Uh, but but strength is one of those universal things. It's not strengths for work. It's strengths for life. If you were going to have me rename the whole thing, and it, it just helps you to be a better um, you know communicator. So if you think about it, here's a, another analogy. So ideation is is in full effect right now. Is is if what I want to do is communicate to someone and they're inside the room, the easiest thing to do is to find the right key to get into the room to have the conversation. And I think strengths really is that key. It's the method that unlocks the communication. You're on fire. I love that. Ideation. That. Ideation. That Morning. Way. By the way, time of day impacts when these things show up. Ideation, creativity, absolutely a pre-lunch activity. Is it? After lunch, I'm going to knuckle down on the plan and achieve something. Okay. By the way, I don't, oh, that, that is... I don't know if that shows up in the data. But for me, time of day matters. I've given you snaps for that. I'm so glad that here that it's during waking hours because a lot of people with ideation, particularly ideation and intellection together, Jeff, tell me it's 2 a.m. <laughs> that the ideas come to them at 2 a.m. And I think that's a miserable time for ideas to come to you. So you'd asked about family. So my, my, my wife has a devil of a time falling asleep. And for me, it's not really hard. And it's one of my favorite things to do when it's time to go to bed and I lay down because it's one of those times when, when, when nothing is expected of me. Uh, you know, there's there, you know, you don't have a job to do. You don't have to mow the yard or any of the things. Um, and I can just sit and think about stuff. And, and so I'll start to think about, uh, in fact, I'll go to bed oftentimes with what idea do I want to think about? What would be fun? Now I fall asleep really easily. So this lasts about 35 seconds, but it, uh, on days that I can't go to sleep, um, and like, especially if I know I have to get up in the morning is I just sort of engage with those thoughts and don't think about not sleeping, but just start to engage in the thoughts. And that usually tires me out and then I fall asleep. Wow. Oh, that's a good technique. Okay. All right, Jeff. Well, the purpose of our car, you know, the purpose of this podcast is to really understand how deeply these things are ingrained in us. And so that's where we coin the term, obey your strengths. If you think about all of your top five, which one of your strengths do you have to obey? Really pay attention to. You can't turn it off. It just has to be a part of your life. Uh, and why? So when we were planning for this and you said, I'm going to ask you this question. And then I thought about this over the past several days. It's kind of different depending on when I when what on, on the moment, even it, it seems. And again, I would think about the morning and I would think about the afternoon. Remember, I say creative, creative things happen better for me in the morning than they do in the afternoon. And I execute on things in the afternoon because I can take all of that mental work that I did in the morning and then just start to execute on the things. And then Achiever is happy and I can, you know, unplug around dinner time. So they all sort of work in concert is is I think part of what I'm saying. But if but if you're going to hold my feet to the fire and say you have to have one, it really is going to fall back to that strategic type stuff because because if I'm going to put that in another term is is I oftentimes say that I um, I read a, a business book early in my career and it talked about you know uh, you're you're one of two type of person you're either a um, a hunter or you're a farmer hunters going out and and blazing new trails the farmer is taking care of the things that were already created and I always say well I lean on the hunter side because I, I like to go do those sorts of things. But the way I've translated that over the years is I like to build things. So when I come into an organization, I like to build a new thing because it allows me to envision an opportunity or challenge or observe an opportunity or challenge and then envision a solution and then execute on that solution. Now, once that's shown successful, I need somebody to run it in the long term because that's not my job. Um, but if I think about those things I have to do, it's going to, it's going to be that. In fact, that's one of the reasons I left Rackspace in 2018 is based on where the company was in its, in its trajectory and its arc over time and where I was in the organization as I lost that ability to build. And what that way that manifested for me when I would go into work each day, I was just like, well, what am I here to do? Even though the things I was doing had value, they didn't, it didn't have value inside. So good. We, when we know when we're doing valuable work because it's the work we value and that's what feeds us and feeds our energy and is the reason we have to pay attention to our strengths. We have to pay uh, respect to our strengths and, and think, yeah, this is what I bring to the table and I got to do it or else I'm going to feel internal dissonance when I walk into work every day. Yeah. Right. Even caused me to leave the company I loved. I was having a great time. I loved the company, and but it, it just wasn't working. And then you came back, though, 
So things yeah, change. I mean, it's amazing how much can change in two years. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah. and there was an opportunity to come in and build. They wanted, I came back for a job that was the CTO inside of the product organization. So translation, for those of you not in tech, it meant that I could take and look at all of the products and services that Rackspace had and envision what should they look like in six months, 12 months, 18 months, and then work with those product owners to create a roadmap to get there. I didn't have to execute on that. I could just envision those ideas, give them the job to go and execute it. What a great job to come back for. You're getting paid to do what you're hardwired to do, Jeff. That's fantastic. Okay, so let's say, I mean, tell us tell us how to stay in touch with you. Tell, tell my audience what to watch for. I know you're very active on LinkedIn, but I'm sure you're active on a lot of channels. I just happen to be on LinkedIn a, a lot. So tell them, how can they stay in touch with you and, and watch what you're doing in the CTO space? You bet. So uh, easiest way to find me is over on LinkedIn. You'll find all sorts of ramblings and posts that I have there. I also have a live stream every Tuesday morning at 830 Central Time. So go, you can check that out. It usually shows up on, on my feed as well as Rackspace's feed. Um, all of that's available through throughout there. Um, where else can you find me? There's a podcast. I have a regular audio only podcast as well. And that's called cloud talk. So that's able, you can find that anywhere the cloud that podcasts are found. Um, and I'd love for you to connect with me on LinkedIn and send me a note. I'd love to hear from you or just send me an email at jeff at diverter.com and we can, we can be best friends. <laughs> that's awesome. You can, you can rely on this relator. <laughs> Yeah, there you That's go. Fantastic. That's fantastic. Well, thanks, Jeff, for being a part of my podcast today. It was so fun to, to catch up with you. And I wish you the best of luck in the second half of 2023. Kathy, this was awesome. Thank you so much for the invitation. Take care. Thank you for listening to Obey Your Strengths. To learn more about Kathy or hire her for your company or private coaching, visit obeyyourstrengths.com. You can also find her on Instagram at kathy.kirsten. Obey Your Strengths is produced by Kirsten Consulting, LLC, in association with Game Day Media out of San Antonio, Texas.